Thanks for staying with us. It's time to go to the press and see what made it to the front pages of some of our national dailies. And joining us this morning to discuss this, uh, this headlines is Mr. Jide Johnson, a public affairs analyst. Uh, good morning and welcome to the program, sir. It's a pleasure to be with you, and Good morning to you. Good day to our viewers all over the world. Mm. Thank God it's Friday. And thank, thank God, God it's, we are at the brink of the end of the month of August as we move into the month of September, the ninth month of the year. Mm. Okay. Ah, September. I remember where I come from, we have what we call New Yam celebration. And it is always every September. So I remember the good old days uh, when we used to celebrate. I don't know if now anybody can buy a goat or a chicken to celebrate that New Yam. But uh, we thank God for life. It's an achievement, by the way. <laughs> well, the yams are coming into the market and they're a bit cheaper compared to what you have about some few months back. At least you will get the chuba of yam for 1,005. Um, compared to what it used to be, 1,000, 9,000 yeah. naira. And uh, we hope that that trend will stay. Mm. We we'll hope continue. so too. We hope so too. Uh, your background seems to change today um, more than what we've always had. Uh, I'm just wondering why. Well, like uh, electric people remove our light despite the fact that we use prepaid meter. They remove our light from the source. Um, I don't know why we use prepaid meter. And despite what the NERC said, concerning the notification, two weeks notification and the rest of it, well, we are still at the mercy of the, some of these agencies. And we need to address that. As soon as I'm through with this program, I'll be going to the office to address that. It's unfortunate that you pay for services, yet you are at the mercy of some of the agencies that are meant to provide services for you, but they're operating as a monopoly. It's mm -hmm. unfortunate. It's really unfortunate, really, really unfortunate. Okay, let's delve into the papers that we are here to uh, talk about. Naira in circulation, uh, 3.66 trillion Naira outside banks and 392 billion Naira in banks. Um, so that is 3.32% or 3.32% decrease in currencies outside the banks. That's according to uh, the... Uh, the, the Central Bank of Nigeria? Well, the, 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 what is good for the economy is for him to have less cash, cash in the economy and that you have majority of your transaction uh, through, through, through liquidity, through what we call um, online, online, online banking. Uh, when you have too much cash in the economy, it's not good for the economy. And with that, you are able to, able to track the transactions that are going on within your economy and then you're able to actively fight corruption and also curtail the activities, those that use currency for nefarious activity in terms of those that collect ransom, ransom for, 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 for kidnapping and those um, that use um, Naira for narcotic, narcotic transaction um, movement and the rest of it. So it's better for you for you to have less currency, physical currency being, being deployed in your economy, but you have most of your... Um, transactional exchange in terms of the exchange concerning business transaction and other form of transaction happening within the bank, which you can track and which you can trace. But when you have too much cash in the economy, it tells you that there's a lot of undercurrent activities going on in the economy. I think if we, if we are able to get to the point in which um, we have about 80-85% 80, 80, of our transaction happening within the bank, I think it will be good for our economy and it will be good to, to, to address the issue of inflation that we have. But do you see it ever happening? Because I'm not sure people trust the banks anymore uh, as much as that. Because uh, you, you're, you're saving money in the bank and you're losing money instead of instead of uh, uh, getting money. So the, the difference between 3.66 trillion and 392 billion is so so wide, uh, if you ask me. Yeah, yeah, the difference is so wide. You asked me this question um, in the past when you drop your money in the bank, in terms of your savings account, there are no deductibles from your account. Uh, this is whatever you do in the bank, whatever transaction you do, there are different types of charges that are collected from you. And that's where the, the, the regulatory body needs to come in. Because actually, it's the regulatory body that imposes this form of deductible um, taxes that you get in your income. For example, there's what is called te techno charges. There's what is called their account maintenance holding charges. There's what is called your card holding charge. So different types of charges which you never experienced before have been introduced in the banking sector, which has made a lot of people to even lose hope in the banking sector. For example, young, if I transfer 10,000 to you, um, I'm winning 10,000. By the time the money gets into your account, 
I'm sure you get 9,000 and something like that, or you get 9,000 and something like that. that has eroded people's confidence in using that, 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 that means of transaction. So I agree with you. Even if you look at, in terms of the trading concerning the shares of these banks, you know, most of them have gone to the, to, to the stock exchange market, declaring public offer for people to buy their shares. You discover that the, the kind of confidence people had in 2004, the kind of confidence people had in 2010, the kind of confidence people had in 2014 concerning investing in, in the banking sector particularly, it's not, it's not, it's not really there, it's not, it's not really there. Uh, you, if, 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 if you operate any account, you discover different types of mail they sent to you about the initial offer. So one of the things that the banking industry, the banking sector of our economy needs to do is to increase public confidence because complete confidence is critical to the success of any any kind of any kind of any kind of business. So until that confidence is restored, until people don't have this feeling that the banks are just taking money away from me, the bank are just making money from me without offering me any services, we'll still find ourselves in this particular this particular situation whereby you still have a lot of transaction happening outside of the banking sector. Beyond that, it's just what has been reported. What has not been reported, we don't know. If you know a lot of, there are a lot of people that are not even interested in putting their money in the banks. I know loads of people. All yeah. you just need to do is to just talk to people on the street and you discover that a lot of people are not even interested in putting their money in the banks. They rather put their money in, in whatever other forms that they think that they can, they can use to secure their money outside of the banking sector. Because if you also look at the experiences of people concerning some of the banks that have become distressed, some of the banks that have been that have been merged and what have you, people that have deposited their money and what happens to their money after those banks become distressed, the, the shareholders are able to get back their fund, whereas the depositors that sustain the bank are not able to assess their fund after the, the banks become distressed. So these are some of the issues that has really, really, really affected people's confidence <clears throat> in the banking sector and also in, in, in ensuring that whatever transaction they do, they do the transaction via the banking transaction and not through physical cash. A lot of people would not do business with you without physical cash. They will tell you, give me the cash. I yeah. don't mind. Yeah. Even, and let me just even add when this. you try to if talk to some of them to United, get a POS, they don't what is want United it. United States of America, uh, let me just add this. Um, if, you, if you follow what Warren Buffett is doing, he, in fact, the person that has the highest number of cash, physical cash today, one of the one of the richest man in the world is Warren Buffett. He's, he has he has billions and billions of naira in terms of his assets that he has converted to pure cash. And so, if somebody, one of the richest man in the world, has converted um, his resources into physical cash, it means that there is going to be a particular bust in the banking sector. I don't know. It's just it's just a, it's just an indication, a prediction of what could likely happen. So, if people like that are not having confidence in in in, in, in having their and they're having their resources in, in, in the banking sector other than having physical cash, then who, are you? who am I to say that that is wrong? Mm. Okay, um, still on the business NG, um, I, I'm even confused what to take first. Federal government invokes a no work, no pay policy as resident doctor strike continue. That's another headline. Well, um, the issue of the resident doctors, I don't know how we need to address this particular issue. Um, what what really the problem? Why can't government address this particular problem? One, we have a lot of um, we have a lot of human capital flight when it comes to the health sector. A lot of our a lot of our doctors and workers in the health services have left this country looking for better opportunities outside the shores of outside the shores of Nigeria. Countries that have soft fall in terms of the production of of their of, of doctors, nurses, and the rest of it, they see Nigeria as 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 a good run in which, as a fatal ground in which they can come and harvest new doctors by providing them with different type of incentives which they are not getting at home. And as I was young, now I'm old, I've always seen resident doctors going on strike, complaining about one thing or the other, and government threatening that, okay, we, do, we apply no work, no pay, a no work, no pay approach to it. And I think the no work, no pay approach does not solve the problem. At the end of the day, the government, we ended up paying this, this set of people their whatever their, their salaries are at the end of the strike, and it's the people that actually suffer. I think what we need to do is to address the, the recurrent problem that leads to their strike. What are the issues that lead to this strike? We address this once and for all. And then we don't have this issue in which medical, medical practitioners will go on, 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 on strike. When they go on strike, it's the people that are affected. The people that are in public offices, they, they seek medical help outside the shores of Nigeria. 
they are not affected by it. And like the popular saying goes, when the elephant, when two elephants fight, it is the grass and the abs that suffer. It is the ordinary people, on, it is not the ordinary people, the ordinary citizen that suffers from it, from this battle of ego on the part of the government and this medical practitioner. I think they should be able to find a common ground. I don't know why, whether there is there is a demon or there is a devil that is involved in that industry that makes them to always go on strike every now and then. The immediate cause of this one is uh, the one of their colleagues who has been, uh, some of their colleagues who were uh, captured, one of them is in the custody of uh, bandits for eight months now. And it seems as if the government is not doing much to uh, release this woman. So they are protesting and saying that uh, something concrete should be done for this woman to be released. And uh, well, now, as according to one of the doctors, they are now an endangered species in the hands of bandits because sometimes uh, they are being kidnapped to be the ones that will be taking care of these bandits and other, other uh, captives uh, in their custody and all that. So well, if government is not I deliberate about that. it, they might, they might just be losing their lives and losing their members to bandits. That's the immediate cause. As of this time last week, we have not secured the release of those 20 medical students that were, that, that, that were kidnapped. We thank God that those medical students were rescued mm -hmm. by the police and they returned to their family. We just get the story on the surface. We don't even know how the police went about securing that. Like the doctors pointed out, an injury to one is injury to all. That's mm -hmm. The basic maximum of, 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 of labor. So if 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 they've discovered that they become an endangered species, which there's no doubt, uh, if 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 you have those if you have those uh, apologies for that sound, is the sound of railway. I still very we understand. To the railway, we understand. To the, to, the, to the railway station. So I think that it's it's important for for government to address this particular this particular issue. There's no doubt they become an endangered species because who are those that will take care of? Of these, of these, of these terrorists and these bandits, when they when, when they are injured, so they, what they do is to, to 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 kidnap doctors and doctors to provide medical services for them. So I think our government needs to address that particular issue and ensure that those those that lady is, is the, the release of that lady is particularly secured. Mm. It's important. Not only the lady, any, the life of every Nigerian is not more important than any other Nigerian. So every life of Nigerian is important. It's the responsibility of government to protect the life and property of a citizenry. So I think that they have a good cause, but I think in the process of fighting the good cause, they don't they don't contribute to 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 to, to another bad cause in society. If mm -hmm. they go on strike, what about the thousands or millions of patients that need their attention? I think they, they need to have a rethink about the approach. Yeah, well, I, I, I support the, the rethink about the approach, but in a situation where you see the government that should be uh, begging or should be promising at least some things that should be, should be done, telling them that uh, no work, no pay, that's the response that they're giving to them, it, it's really disheartening. It, it almost shows that the government is not ready to do what they're supposed to do, because at this point, uh, they should be... That some of, yeah. Don't forget that when we talk about the government, we have the, we have the engine of the government. We have the permanent secretary of Ministry of Health, which is also a medical doctor himself. We have people in different agencies of government that are, and so sometimes it is the membership of even this association that are on the other side, on the administrative side, that are that usually turn blind eye to 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 to, to their members. It's government with them. ministers will come, ministers will go, but the the the, the real technocrat that handles the administrative side, the disciplinary side, of. Of, of 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 these agencies are even medical doctors themselves who are just who have just found themselves on the technical side of government. So sometimes some of our problems are initiated by people that are members of of, of our association. Okay, well, uh, before we move from this the business uh, ng, let's take this final one, which is almost on all newspapers as well. Ajairo, police find no evidence. Remember, he was invited last week. He couldn't go. He went this week and police found no evidence on someone who they accused of uh, terrorism financing. They just invited him, he went there in, uh, with, in company of uh, Femi Falano, Dejia Deonju, and a few others, and the police found no evidence. I think if you should the Nigerian police, the police made um, the media trial has been done concerning him. If you see concerning the issue, the, and the exchanges even on social media, concerning um, nobody is above the law, Everybody that breaks the law should be prosecuted and what have you. And, and it shows that um, they did do their due diligence before they, before they publicize 
the issue and make a, a, a the public uh, demand for him to appear before them. If they have done their due diligence and they have done their intelligence, they, there's no need for us to have all of this drama and eat up the policy. You know what? That contributed to the policy itself, how the entire how the, the entire system was heated up as a result of the invitation to, to the NLC president to appear before the police on terrorism charges. And at the end of the day, there are no charges with him. I think that um, if I were a general, what I would do is I would sue the Nigerian police and I would sue the federal government and I would seek damages concerning it in terms of the, the, the damage they've done to my reputation, in terms of the public trial and the media trial that, are, that I've engaged in. Uh, the, 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 the media... The media has been awashed with different types of story concerning his person, and this was an attempt to 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 to, to destroy uh, and mischaracterize his person. So if I were him, I would sue the police, and uh, so that then uh, when they pay damages, because children yet unborn will come and read newspapers before his appearance and see that he was accused. He's already been, in Nigeria. You'll be accused. You'll be prosecuted. In, he's been prosecuted in the court of public opinion. How will the damage be done? How would damage control be done concerning what has been done in the public, in the court of public opinion concerning what happens in the in the in, in the in, in the in the normal proper court? And if you lose that of public opinion, that's the most unfortunate thing. If I were him, um, um, I'm not his strategist, I'm not his consultant, but we are offering him that now he should just sue the Nigerian police so that the Nigerian police will do their due diligence before they accuse anybody, any citizen of terrorism charges. And, and 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 make a public spectacle of an issue in which they could have done administratively inter internally without even the public getting to know about it. Okay, we move to Daily Trust now. And uh, one of the first headlines I'm taking there is crash food prices in one month, federal government tells uh, traders. So they're giving moratorium of one month that after that there will be sanctions, there will be consequences on the traders who refuse to crash uh, prices of goods well i think that um uh, how would the price of goods crashes our government crashed the price of petroleum products uh, as government even look one of the major factors that contributes to drive price of goods and services transportation you know i told you i grew up very very close to the railway station um in the 60s in the 70s in the 80s in the 90s you see railways railway was just the major means of transportation of moving goods and services through the length and breadth of this country. Um, how many trailers do we have in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s? How many trailers do you have that move goods? Even when you talk about uh, food produce and even when you talk about cattle, cattle were moved while I was young through, through the rail system, from the north down to the south, even down to the east. But these days you have cattle are moved through railway, through, 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 through road transportation. So if government is looking for how to crash and of what are we doing in terms of providing logistics of people that are moving the goods from the rural area down to the urban urban area where these goods and services are needed? It's not just government fiat. It's about putting in place structures and policies that that tends to to, to make it easier. But we are the silos. We are the silos. We produce enough food. We produce enough food in terms of food uh, and even 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 fruits that can sustain this country. But what happens to a lot of this? A lot of it gets spoiled because there are no means of transportation from moving in from the point of production to the point of to the, to the point of to the point of needs to the market, and then there are no silos to preserve some of these some of some of these things that are produced. So what government should do beyond just reading out a fiat is for them to provide these facilities to provide these these facilities that are required. I've told people over time the ministry of our the ministry of our economy in the sixties was agriculture, and why why the eastern region, the western region, despite the fact that we never discovered oil then, and the northern region were able to sustain themselves, they were able to build a lot of infrastructure. The Liberty Stadium was built through agriculture. Uh, Cocoa House, the, large, the tallest house in Africa, was built. NT, the first TV, the NTV, pardon, the first TV station in Africa, we can go on and on and on. The granite pyramids were built through resources that were gotten from agriculture. Now that we have even discovered oil, we don't even have iconic we don't even have those iconic structure structure again because government has not made the right investment in what they need to make investment in, provide silos, provide transportation in which it can make it cheaper for people to move the goods that is produced in the local and rural area into the cities where they are needed. And there can be quick exchange of value. The, 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 the producers will get money and the and the users will get 
we, we, we get we get the products that they need and it will sustain we sustain that those are the areas in which government needs to to work to think and to work about not reading out fiat hmm. okay um, you are thing. you are in the education sector and i'd like your opinion on this second another headline here students seek review of federal government's 18-year admission eligibility that's been in the news that the minister of Education has said that you cannot write WAIC or JAMB or WASP if you are not up to 18 years of age. And then you are going to uh, only get admission into primary one when you are up to six years and all that. So I'd like your comment but on I that. Think what, I, think what, I think what government should be interested in is what's the curriculum, what's even, what are you even teaching these children? I, 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 have a family, I have a family friend who has a, a seven-year-old and a five-year-old um, daughter, and you know the number of subjects they do. If seven-year-old is doing 19 subjects, the five-year-old is doing, the five-year-old is doing, is doing 17 subjects. And what what is going to put in there? What's even the value of the curriculum? What are we training the students to? Are we training? Are we training them? It's not beyond. It's what the focus of the minister is just on the age. My own focus is what are we teaching these students? Would they even be relevant in the 21st century and beyond? Would they be relevant in the second, in the second, in the second decade? Of 21st century and beyond, what 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 will be the needs of our society? What will be the needs of 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 the labour market? What will be the needs of the industry? These are the things we should be focusing we should be focusing on first and foremost before you even talk about the age the age the age pegging. I agree to a large extent that no child should go to school until it's four. It's four. You see, we have belaboured. I didn't go to school until I was I was I was five to six. And if you are in if you are in, if, 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 if you are in the if you are in academics now, every lecturer will tell you that by the time they get to school, they are no longer interested because they've been belabored with different types of subjects. They've been they've been bombarded with all manners all manners of subjects, all manners of topics. That by the time they are they are they are in first year or second year in, in tertiary institution, they are no longer interested. People are not because they've been they've they've been overloaded with a lot of with a lot of things. Look. If they give a five-year-old an assignment today, when we were young, we are doing our own assignment, assignment by ourselves. But you know who do the assignment with their children today? It's the parents or the teacher they hire to come and to come and to come and tutor their their words after school that they would do the assignment. When you are involved in doing the assignment with the kids, you are no longer these kids are no longer doing the assignment. So I think there is too much emphasis on certification, other than what is the curriculum that are being taught the students. What skills are we equipping them with? What knowledge are we equipping them with? Are this knowledge going to be relevant in the 21st century and beyond? These are the areas in which. Okay, uh, well, uh, we'll take a final headline from the Daily Trust. Um, Zamfara residents <laughs> killed 37 bandits. Zamfara residents kill 37 bandits. Uh, it seems as if the people are taking the laws into their hands themselves to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the, the insecurity is nipped. I wouldn't say in the bud, but it, at least it's, it's curtailed or it's, it's reduced. They went into the forest themselves and got these bandits. Whether all of them, all the 20, 37 were bandits or not, I don't know the investigation that they made, but they went into the bush themselves because I'm sure there's a failure of the security agencies in that area. So they went themselves and got 37 bandits killed. I don't know what your reaction will be to that. Uh, well, uh, in Yango, if you recall in the, in the late 80s and in the late 90s, which led to the rise of vigilante. Vigilante in, in, in Nigeria and particularly in the Southwest, when we have the, the menace of armed robbery, the menace, remember, remember yeah. Anini, Anini. Anini's and period of time. And uh, Monday Osubo and the rest of them, and yeah. then you have the incessant arm robbery, left, right, and but it was a menace, just like we have banditry as menace now. That's the menace we had in the 80s and in the 90s. It has to take the self help of the people. Every community, every street had to form a vigilante group to protect themselves because the normal security, the normal security apparatus could not protect the citizen from the menace of arm robbery. And that's how the issue of arm robbery was nipped in the board. And I think that. Um, if you have to, that's when you see that people always advocate for community policing. What you have seen is, is an informal level of community policing. The community taking the policing of their environment into their own hands and ensuring that they provide uh, protection protection for themselves. So when you see the failure of government agencies in doing that, I think that isn't, there's nothing wrong for people coming together, banding together, and resorting to community self-help 
in order to address to address that particular problem. The the the, the bandits are just are just few. They are not they are not many. So the resolve of the, the entire community we prevent we, we we always we always prevail over 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 the menace of few. Mm. Okay, um, let's go to the uh, Punch newspaper and take a few, if we, if we can have that time. We have like three minutes more. Chinubu okays 50% electricity subsidy for hospitals and others. Well, that uh, those, those are special services, and we shouldn't be, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be um, imposing um, the normal tariff on them because they are providing humanitarian, 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 humanitarian services. And I think that that's that's beyond the hospitals. I think those that are even in the hospitality businesses um, that are providing uh, a hospitality business, those people should be provided with some special tariffs. So as because they contribute to the growth of the economy. Uh, when people are coming, when you are inviting foreign investors into your economy, into your country, the first place of contact they have contact with are the hospitality, the people in the hospitality business and beyond the hospital. So I think that government needs to look in, 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 into that direction and provide incentives in order for us to actually grow our economy. I think it's a step in the right direction and that should be commended. Mm. But what about schools? What about other, other places, you know? You yeah, know. thank you, Yango. Thank you, Yango. Uh, I think that those are providing, you know, government used to identify essential services. For example, even media organizations too. Media organizations do not exist to make profit. They exist to serve the need of the citizen. Just imagine if you are not able to come on here. All media organizations are not able to come on here because if you look at what is the running cost of 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 of, of, of running media organization, I don't know how media organization are surviving in this economy. And we need to we need to salute the courage of both the owners and those that are working in these various organizations in trying to maintain and sustain democracy. I agree with you. When you look at media organizations, when you look at schools, people that are running essential services. Who are those that were precluded from, from any type of a coffee and the rest of it, which are these industries? I, I think government needs to. And I think the media and, 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 and schools are probably essential services. And I think that we need to look into that and for us to really to really ensure that we provide we provide leverage for people that are contributing to the growth of, of our nation, human capital development, and the growth of our economy. I agree with you in totality. Mm. Thank you for adding that, Yango. You are okay. the best. <laughs> uh, well, it's a good way to end this segment this morning. We'd like to thank you, Mr. Johnson, for coming on the program. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Have a wonderful weekend. You too, and when sir. we see, we see in the month of September, and God will remember you and I for good. Amen. Amen to that. We've been talking to Mr. Jide Johnson, a public affairs analyst, and uh, we were reviewing the papers and seeing what the headlines were this morning in some of our uh, major newspapers. We'll take a short break and uh, we'll return with our first hot topic. Stay with us.